Um, we are vertically integrated, like I introduced you to Mike Miles and Doug Pettifor, our engineers. So we own our facilities in China. We work with the engineers in China. So if we do find a problem or if an OEM tells us about something that may be happening under a certain circumstance or if you guys come up with something, we are actually able to address that issue and fix it if it actually is a problem. So we don't have to go to a third party. We are in control of our product. We do our own warranty, we deliver our own stuff, and we stand behind our product. Um, Jesse explained downstairs that we have a 45 day inventory, so I don't think we've ever ran out of product. Um, if you go to the next page, that's going to be our products. And I have each one of our products laid out on this table up here in this one. You can't see them as well when we start talking about the products. I'll walk around with it so you can see it as we talk about it. But um, we start. We're going to start with converters. So if you go to the next page, it's starting with WFCO converters. We have a, a mix of everything up here. So when we talk about converters, we're talking about a few of the products up here. But the first thing is. What is a converter? Does anyone here know what a converter does? I mean, I'm not sure what other products you guys sell, but a converter takes your 120 volt house power and converts it into 12 volt battery power. Um, all of our converters are three stage converters. And what that means is they our converters not only power the RV with the 12 volt products, it actually charges the battery as well. So when we say we have a three stage converter, there are different three there are three different charging profiles for the battery out of our converter. So you have a 13.2 float mode, you got 13.6 absorption mode, and a 14.4 bulk mode. And what those mean are just different charging rates for the battery. So Float mode is going to be your short um, trickle mode, so if the battery's full, it's just going to keep it charged up completely. Our 13.6 absorption mode is going to be what you're going to be in 95% nine, of the time, and that's just normal charging. And then 14.4 is a boost mode that is going to charge the battery up quicker if the battery's completed to a certain point. Um, another fact about our converters are this is going to be something you guys hear in the dealerships. Our fans are load based. So when I say load based, is most fans on converters or electric, electrical products out there are heat based. So when they get hot, the fan comes on to cool it down. So our fan is load based. So when I say load based, about five amps of load on the converter, that fan's going to start and it's going to stay on forever until you get below that threshold. So all of our products have a different threshold of start on and off for our fans. So on some of our smaller converters, that fan might start on about three amps, and then that fan will stay on forever until you get below three amps. Some of our products start at about five amps, and will stay on forever until you get below that threshold. Um, that's a very, there's no one else that uses a fan like this, so you're gonna have questions from dealers, customers. That's one of the biggest things we get a call about because say all oh, my fans running all the time well there means there's a load on the converter so not necessarily that the converter is super hot and the fan just keeps running that's just how our product differs from pretty much every other converter out on the market is that more efficient does it keep it cooler my theory is I'm not sure because they designed this a long time ago my my theory is um, other components that wait to turn the fan on until the product gets hot. Electrical components do not like heat, so the, there's a heating and cooling of those components. With our fans starting on before the product gets hot itself, I feel like it has more longevity because it's cooling it before it gets to that, hey, I'm hot and need to turn the fan on. So I feel like there's more longevity with the fan that cools before the heat is there. All of our converters are equipped with reverse polarity fuses. When we start going over each individual product, I'll show you where those reverse polarity fuses are. But reverse polarity fuses there are there for the for the instance when 
or if they hook the battery up backwards. So instead of damaging the product itself, it's going to blow these fuses, whether they hook up the battery backwards or whether they hook up or wire up their seven way backwards. It's just preventing that reverse polarity going to the battery to actually damage the converter itself. All of our converters are equipped with those. Um, another thing is our, all of our converters are equipped with uh, short, ooh, overcurrent and short circuit protection, so they shut down if they get like a dead short or anything like that. They're also over temperature protectant, so even though the fan runs all the time, doesn't mean they don't get hot because sometimes they'll install the converter in a small area where it's not getting the airflow. So even though the fan's running, maybe it's circulating hot air, so it will shut down in an over temperature situation. And all of our converters provide a clean signal, so they're not gonna affect your radios or um, TVs or any of that nature. They will have some interference with like CB radios, some of the old um, AM stations, just because they're a little bit weak signals, so there will be a little bit of interference on those, but not on your FM or TV. And all of our converters are UL listed and compliant, so that kind of separates ourselves from some of the competitors out there as well. Sometimes they'll just be ECL or, they, I think they're still tested UL, but I think UL is a little more stringent test and it costs a little bit more money, but all of our viewers are UL certified. Does our competition have all those same things you just went over? Um, the reverse polarity and the shutdown, I mean, do all converters have that or is that something we do that other people don't? Not, not all of the competitors, but the competitors that you guys are going to be up against will. So the big competitors that a dealer is going to use are probably going to have the same across the board, UL, reverse polarity, over temperature, short circuit. So those aren't, those aren't one-off things, that's just kind of the standard. So if you don't have the standard, you're really not in the ball game. Who's the largest competitor? Um, progressive Dynamics. And the OEM side would be Progressive Dynamics. Um, I think they're kind of heavy in the aftermarket as well, but there's some other guys in the aftermarket that you guys might see that there are some dealers out there that swear by this brand. There's a dealer out there that I know is just a Parallax goop. He just loves Parallax for some reason. But if you notice when you guys start getting into it a little more, you look on Parallax, if you were to buy it aftermarket, it's like $400. So I mean, there's a price difference and it's not because it's better. It's just because it's old and it's not made anymore. And to get that same part, is extremely expensive. Ours are cost effective and we have a warranty that no one else can really stand by. Um, you go ahead and flip your page again. We're going to start with the 8700 series converter. This is going to be this little guy right here. This is 30 amp service. Does everyone here know what 30 amp service is between 50 amp service? I'm just not sure what all I really need to explain, but this is a 30 amp panel. Um, our 8700 comes in a 12 amp DC output model, 25 amp DC output model, 35 and 40. So we have the same converter all the way from 12 to 40 amps. Um, the nice thing about the 8700 series is that the pre-wired, a lot of the OEM guys like pre-wired. And the aftermarket side, I'm not sure how hot this is just because pre-wired is kind of a pain because this is not something you can just replace the board in. This is something that you have to replace this whole box. So this one, I mean, they're gonna replace these because if it's bad, it has to be replaced, but it's not as easy as some of the other products that we'll get into. Um, the specs on these. Do you say the aftermarket's pre-wired too, or two different? They are. No, they're all the same. Okay. It's just when we get in some of our other products, they're easier to swap out. So I mean, no. people are going to gripe about this one <clears throat> just because this is 
it comes and goes just like this. So it gets put in like this, it gets taken out like this. Some of our other products, you can remove one part and swap in a new one and be good to go. Um, the one I have here in my hand is an 8735. This one and our 48 model are our biggest sellers in the 8700 models. Um, some of the specs they have with them, they're zero clearance, so what that means is um, it doesn't need any space behind the converter. It actually breathes through the front. So this could be in a very small enclosure that you don't need a lot of room. So this can be in some of your really small pop-ups or very small travel trailers. Um, the 87, 25, and 12 are just like this, but they are not zero clearance. Um, there's not a huge market on the 12 and 25, just because if I was to take these out, the 87, 35, and 40 have three stabs on your AC side. So you have three stabs that you put breakers on. And you can use single breakers or double breakers. So you can technically have six AC circuits on this one. And on the DC feed board, you have six DC circuits. Larry, on 87, 25, and 12, you only have two stabs and four DC circuits. Um, I'm going to repeat myself on a lot of things with our fans, they're low base. So again, on the 8700 model, it's going to be a lot lower start point for the fan to kick off. And then when we move over to our DC fuse board, we have LED blown fuse indicators. You can't see the light, but right next to these fuses over here, when there's a fuse blown, you will have a light that illuminates and indicates you have a blown fuse. Does our competition do that? On some products. Um, some do and some don't. And even we'll use Progressive Dynamics as a, an example. On some of their products, they have those. And some of their products, they don't. On some of their most used products, they really don't have them. It's kind of on their higher end products. But all of our products across the board, if they have a DC fees board, all of our DC boards have a flow fuse indicator, it's just a standard across the board for us. So it's not really a standard across the board for everyone. Um, if you were to look at the back of this pigtail, you have six circuits. One is your battery circuit and the rest are your just 12 volt DC circuits. You have two heavier gauge wires that would go to your battery. So this is going to charge your battery. And then you're going to have six DC circuits available for your lights, your water pump, um, slide outs, whatever you want to put on there. Um, like I said, this is, I mean, a lot of OEMs use this one, but this isn't something that pretty reliable, it's not something you're going to see that you're going to need to switch out or push too hard because uh, some of the other products that we're going to talk about are used a lot more often. If you flip the page, we're going to talk about some of the problems and solutions that you guys may encounter. <coughs> I highlighted a couple that are the most common. Um, there's some other ones listed there and you'll be able to take these with you. So if you run into these problems, you'll be able to just reference back to this PowerPoint. But the first one is um, the red LED warning light is always on and the fuse is good. Like I said, all of our DC fuse boards have a blown fuse indicator. The blown fuse indicator um, does not always light just because the fuse is blown. For example, um, if you have two of these wires touching on the back pigtail, if, if you can see there's all these little strands on these pigtails, if those strands are touching another wire or another piece of metal that's behind this, like sometimes it'll be on the frame, it'll kind of show like a little short and that red LED will actually light up during that instance as well. Um, there are some, just like any product out there, you do have just um, 
United States, but you do have a bad circuit out there every now and then. And with tons and tons of these going out, I've seen bad fuse boards where the red LED lights up and just stays lit for no good reason. The circuit still works, but something happened in that red LED that just keeps it on. If we go to the one right below that, it's gonna say the red LED will light, will not come on and the fuse is bad. So that takes us, that's probably gonna be the one you hear most commonly. So what they're saying is, say this fuse was bad and it's blown and that red LED did not come on. For that red LED to come on, the load has to be present. And what I mean by present is, say that fuse went to your awning. Well, that awning's on a rocker switch, so it only goes out or in when you hold that button. So for the load to be present and the circuit to be complete, you have to actually hold that button. And then when you're holding the button, that red LED light would be on. Or say your bathroom, say your bathroom light was on that fuse and they have the bathroom light in the off position. Well, that circuit's not completed, so that light's not gonna be lit. But if you went in the bathroom and flipped the light on, even though the light doesn't come on, this red LED would show because the load there for the present. Um, there's a few listed below that that I didn't highlight, which, like I said, you guys can take these and use it as a reference. If you look at the next page, you see number six highlighted as well. And that is um, the fan is running consistent with, consistently with nothing on. Um, like I said, our, our fans are load based. I'm going to repeat myself a lot when it comes to a couple things. But our fans are load based, and if they have everything on in the coach and the fan's still running, the battery is a load itself. So if they have a battery connected to the system, uh, the battery is a load itself. And a lot of times it's the battery charging or if they say nothing's been on for a couple days and the battery is still pulling the fan on, um, usually they'll indicate like a, a weaker dead cell in the battery itself. So a weaker dead cell in the battery can actually prolong the fan from running because it thinks it needs to keep charging and might cycle a little bit. So the battery is a load the battery can make the fan run as well. The battery's taking from the converter. Um, there's some other ones listed below that as well, but we don't really need to get into those. That's all I really have on the 87. Like I said, this is one of our popular products, but it's not used nearly as much as the next product we're going to talk about. So if you flip the page, we're going to talk about our most used product, and that is this one. This is our 8955 PEC. So this is an 8900 series converter. We have um, amperage models anywhere from 35 to 75. And they're all 30 amp service. Um, our 55 is the most common. This one down. This one has five stabs, so you can have five single breakers or five double breakers. So you can technically have up to 10 AC circuits on this one, and it has 11 DC circuits. So 10 on your AC, 11 on your DC. This one gives people a lot of range to add more things in the future. So if the OEM only uses um, some of their AC breakers and some of their DC breakers, this gives the customer the ability to add anything on the twelve AC side. Um, this is just like all of our other converters has plum fuse indicators on your DC fuse board. It has um, a load based fan and it's a three stage charger, just like <clears throat> the other converters that we have talked about. Um, the, if you look at the last little check there, the 8965 and 75 are zero clearance. You're not going to see those that much out there. Um, 65 and 75 is kind of getting um, blown off to the side now that people are using LED lighting and the loads are a lot less than they used to be when you had incandescent bulbs. So a lot of what you're going to see now is about 55 amp and below. But our 55 amp does vent through the back. So you do need space behind these. So 
Um, that's what our auditors do when they go out to these factories. They see where they're installing these, making sure they're not in a zero clearance space where it could be overheating or anything like that. Or if they're, we've had them where heat ducts are laid across these or just things that don't make sense because it does suck in air through the back and blow it out the front. Um, A lot of things we're going to talk about are very repetitive because all of our products are the same, just in a different format. In three stage, low base fan, low fuse indicators, three stage charging. So if you flip the page, the very first highlighted one is going to be the red LED warning light is always on and the fuse is good. Again, um, with this one, I should have brought a screw gun. This has screw terminals. It's not pre-wired like our 8700. Mm -hmm. So this one, you can see there's a screw terminal for each of the 11 DC circuits in there. So they actually have to manually wire it and then tighten it with the screw. Um, so when you have a red LED on with these, you could be they didn't twist their fine threads together and put it in the screw itself. So if you touch in the screw above or below it, so a lot of times we tell them to make sure 
it's twisted up really good and that the screw or the wires under the one screw not touching something else in there. So that would explain why a red LED could be on here and the fuse is actually good. Is that going to be a better for aftermarket as far as installs a better deal than having it with the wires sticking out the back do you think? Or? Oh this one absolutely for aftermarket and uh, we're going to uh, Further in our training, we're going to talk about some like crossover sheets, and like this can actually replace some of the other ones out in the market. And but for this one as a whole, this is our biggest seller, so this is in most of the trailers out there. And for this one, this is all you got to do to replace it. So five wires instead of rewiring your whole coach, you literally have five wires and two screws that hold this in. So this is your best friend. And it's honestly a good unit, but just like any other electrical component out there, they're susceptible to moisture, heat, high voltage, low voltage. So I've had people call and say that they've gone through three converters in six months. <clears throat> probably not our converter, it's probably something you're doing or subjecting it to. Especially people in the mountains are people that go through a lot of brownouts. You're going to have a lot higher rate of failure in some areas than others. Um, your next highlighted portion will be the red LED warning light will not come on and the fuse is bad. Again, that's going to be going back to your load has to be present. So light switch has to be in the on position. If it's a slide out, you have to be pushing the slide out button to actually get that red LED light to come on because the load therefore has to be present. Um, view below that as well. Uh, if you want me to talk about more of the problems that they might see in solutions? As much as we can. Okay. If you look at number three, it says the converter is not charging the battery or total appliances are not working while the battery is not plugged in. I guess I could have talked about this on the 8700. But as we started in the beginning, all of our converters are provided with reverse polarity fuses on the 8700 and they come with the converter itself. It's not something someone has to install, so they're already ready there for them. Another thing I should tell you guys, converters do not come with breakers or fuses. So I get calls sometimes because if they look at some of our aftermarket uh, boxing, it has breakers and fuses in the picture, but they're not provided with breakers or fuses. And like I tell people on the phone, also in that picture there's an RV and there's this girl in a convertible and those don't come with it either. <laughs> um, we can't provide breakers and fuses because we don't know what their loads are going to be. So you can't provide across the board breakers and fuses because everything's going to be wired differently. So you break and fuse according to what the load is going to be. But what we do provide is a reverse polarity fuse in all of our products to protect it in the event of hooking up your battery backwards. Or shorting out your 12 volt wires. So on the 87, you have it there. And then on the 89, you have 240 and reverse polarity fuses right here on the DC fuse board. Again, that's there to protect the converter. Also what those fuses do, if those fuses blow, this converter will not put anything out to your 12 volt appliances nor your battery. So without those fuses, this converter is just sitting stagnant doing nothing. So those fuses have to be good in order to charge your battery or run your total load appliances. Just like batteries in your remote. The remote's not going to work unless you have batteries. We get so many. Yep. Do you offer for sale the fuses? We don't. We don't offer breakers or fuses. The customer has to go to another supply to get the fuses for these? Um, Correct, but the nice thing is we use regular automotive fuses, so they can get them at some gas station, they, they can go to AutoZone, they can go to anywhere that sells automotive ATC fuses. Um, and our breakers are very standard house breakers as well, so they can go to Home Depot, Ace Hardware. It's not something they have to search out to find a specific, I mean, they, it is a specific breaker, but it's not an uncommon breaker that you can't find at any hardware store. So they're very easily accessible to everyone out there.
Does the battery charge, the amperage on the battery charge vary upon model, or is it the same um, battery charge on each? Okay, that's one thing I can explain. This is for all of our converters, regardless of the amperage model. So what I have in my hands is an 8955 converter. So what that means is the 55 stands for 55 amps DC. So you can look at this as like a bank. The 8735 had 35 amps available. So that has 35 amps available in the bank. This has 55 amps available in the bank. So the converter does not put amperage. This can't force amperage onto anything. Amperage is taken. So it provides voltage. It just has 55 amps available. So the battery can take all 55 amps if it's needing it or if they have multiple batteries. Um, but one thing you need to know is the RV comes first. So if they're running a whole bunch of lights, water pump, stuff like that, say they're using 20 amps in the coach, you have 35 amps available left on this one. So you have 35 amps available for those batteries, but it's not forcing anything on the batteries, the battery's actually taking from it. So if you put an amp meter on your battery cables and that battery's dead, you might see 35 amps for five minutes, then you're gonna see it slowly decreasing until that battery's full. And what it's doing is creating resistance in that battery. So once there's so much resistance, it's not going to be taking any amperage, but voltage will always be present. Um, and like I said, that's, that's standard across the board with all of our converters. They're, I just like to explain them. They're a bank. This is there for the taking. It's not something that it's putting out to anything. It's not like your typical battery charger where it's putting out 10 amps to your battery consistently. So this is a variable, it could be pushing 30 amps, could be pushing 5 amps. Um, back to number three, we're not charging battery or 12 volt supply and appliances not working off the battery. If these fuses are blown, nothing's going out and nothing's coming in. So these fuses activate, not activate, but make this board live. So either out or in, these are the first line of defense. So if they're blown, you're not gonna get anything to your battery, nor will your battery come in to power anything off your fuse board. So the first thing you wanna check is these two fuses, because when this is not plugged in short power, your battery's wired to this fuse board, and everything on this fuse board will run off your battery. So it's not like it's a separate system. The battery's wired to here, so your line of operation would be incoming short power, to the converter, to the fuse board, out to your battery or appliances, and vice versa. So appliances to the fuse board to your appliances. Do those have a LED light? So you know if the fuse is blown or not, or you just have to replace the fuse. This fuse board? Yeah. With yeah the, all the fuses itself. Uh, no, that's a good question. That's not something we talk about. The reverse polarity fuses do not have uh, red LED. I'm not sure why. So if you want to ask me why. Meeting over. We're done. <laughs> no, that's a good question, and no, they don't. And um, a lot of people like to do a visual look of fuses, but sometimes a fuse can blow and not be such a visible break as some of the others. One thing I do in my hands-on training with people is um, to defer, not defer, to separate a fuse to see how it's been blown. It has a black mark in the center of the fuse that's going to short. The darker the black spot, the deeper the short. If it's a clean break and no black mark, that's from over amperage. So the easiest way for people to tell if they have a short to see if there's black soot in the center of that fuse, if it's just a clean break, maybe that fuse is too, it's underrated. Maybe the fuse holder itself is loose. And that's another thing, if the fuse holder is loose, that could help prematurely blow that fuse because it's it's a thermal thing. Once it gets so hot, it's going to crack down the middle and blow. Um, number four is converter trip solar power GFI. You're going to hear this one a lot because a lot more people are uh, still on GFCIs. I think they're becoming more standard in households like that they want to plug into their garage. All converters on the market the way they operate have the potential to trip a GFCI. There's nothing wrong with the converter. We 
we don't recommend people plug into GFCI because it does have the potential of tripping them. It won't trip them every time. Some are more sensitive than others, so on and so forth. But every converter on the market, just by the way these operate, does have the potential of tripping the GFCI. So that's going to be one thing you hear all the time. And you can tell them they can replace this, and the next one they get, it's probably going to do the same thing if it's that certain GFI. It might not. So switching out the converters because it's tripping out your GFCI is not going to fix the solution because the potential is always going to exist. You look like you have a question about what I'm saying. No, I just, when you say not recommended, I mean, everything I just did on my shed, I mean, every run has a GFCI at the beginning of that run. So I couldn't plug it anywhere into my shed. Well, the one thing you can, one way you can get around it is a completely discharged converter. So what I mean discharge is those two little capacitors that I talked about earlier that look like two batteries in there that will blow on high voltage. If those are loaded up, it probably won't trip the GFCI, but the loading of capacitors have the potential of tripping GFCI. So like if we were to plug this converter in right now with completely dead capacitors, the potential is going to be higher than a converter that may be already hooked to a battery because once you hook to a battery it's going to load up those capacitors and it's not going to be loading up the system like that and it might not trip the GFCI but this one has a higher potential since those capacitors and circuitry need to be loaded so the one thing you can tell your customers is make sure it's connected to a battery so the capacitors are loaded up and that will limit the possibility of tripping the GFCI. Is that true with our competitors too? We're all converted that way. Yep, just because the, the way they operate and the way a GFCI is going to trip, they kind of butt heads together. So the way to get around that is to make sure this is loaded up in some sense by like being connected to a battery. Um, let me flip to the next page. We'll go back to the repetitive. The fan is consistently running. And again, a lot of times you're going to find out that it's going to stem from the battery, especially people that use interstate batteries. I'm not trying to knock interstate, but got a lot of calls on interstate batteries and people will tell you, um, my battery's brand new. And what I try to explain to them is battery could be new to you, but how long did that battery sit on the floor in a warehouse not getting maintained or anything. So I mean, just because it's new to you doesn't mean that that battery sat there for six months. There's some places that sell good batteries and they do test them before you can walk out of the store with them. But if they go to Walmart and buy a battery, who knows when that battery got there and you're the lucky one that drew it out. <clears throat> so again, a bad battery is going to pose a lot of problems on converters because it's going to, the converter is going to think that the battery needs to charge, so it's going to keep going back and forth. So if you hear fluctuating of the fan, that's a symbol to me that Maybe that battery is a little confusing as a dead or weak cell. So batteries will be a load on the converter and can affect how it operates. I know a lot of people that set up permanent. The dealer just assumes that because you're plugged in all the time, don't worry about your battery. And that's what the converter will lower half of. That so the battery just sits there and pulls power out of that, so it's constantly running and overheating. And they don't even think about it. Well, I'm set, I'm set up permanent. I don't ever use my battery for anything, and I just assume it's always going to be good. It doesn't matter how old it is, but that's not true. It's not true because batteries, most batteries are maintenance batteries. So they right. have water levels, and you need to check those. Yeah. They sulfate. I mean, batteries go bad. There's maintenance free batteries out there, but those cost more. Um, or they take the battery completely out and just leave the wire, and they don't realize that that just, like I said, loading it up. If the power goes out, they don't have a battery on it at all. As soon as your power comes on, it's trying to load that back up and it's making that circuit hot. Correct, and you have a good point. Um, batteries are there as like a backup. It's almost like a safety measure. Show off. Right. Batteries do not have to be installed for these converters to work. It's going to work exactly the same whether there's a battery connected to the system or not. Um, a battery is just there in the instance that you don't have short power, you can run your 12 volt stuff off of your batteries. Or with some of the heavier loads like hydraulics, like leveling systems, 
um, slide outs, anything that has a high amp draw, instead of putting all that stress on just the converter, the batteries there is kind of a booster to help get those out without stressing the converter so much because some of those hydraulics, they pull 100 amps. So I mean, this would be overloaded since this is a 55 amp converter. You'd probably see your lights dim down and they'd be dim until you get release the button and then everything would brighten back up. But batteries are not required, but we do recommend them. flickering of the interior lights or the converter fans acting erratically. It's exactly what I was just talking about is the battery can affect the way this converter is running. So um, a good battery is going to take the charge and evenly and just dwindle down until it doesn't need to charge anymore. A weak or dead cell can trick the converter into saying, hey, I need to charge. No, I don't. So it can go back and forth. So with the fan going higher and lower, um, the lights can also flicker up. Uh, more bright and more dim than just being a steady brightness. Um, one thing I didn't touch base on is our fans are three speed fans. So when the fan first comes on with a low, it's going to be at a low, um, low rotation. And then once you get more amperage on the system, it's going to speed up a little bit. And then when you get a little bit more, it's going to speed up to high. And it'll also dwindle down the same way until you get to the point where it just shuts off. Last one on here is number seven is converter keeps shutting down. Um, and that goes to the, the cooling of the unit. It has the over temperature protection like we talked about with all of our products. This one sucks supposedly cold air through the back and blows it out the front. But if this is in a compartment where they can throw their coat or the factory just installed it in a very small cabinet or under maybe one of the benches where it doesn't breathe that well or they install it next to the furnace motor like we've had some of the OEMs do. Um, once this gets hot it will shut down so their lights will be running healthy and fine and then all of a sudden it goes black and then 10 minutes later all of a sudden the lights are back and everything's working like it should and they'll go through the cycle all day. So what that can be is something's either obstructing or there's a heating element that's creating this to shut down from lower temperature protection. How much space do you tell them they need since, or is there a spec on it? Or is it we tell them um, two cubic feet. Oh. So it's not much, but it kind of is when you get into the factory. In RV. Because they do not design an RV around this. They put this wherever it fits. So they don't design in their plans, oh, this, we're going to put converters here. Now they put the RV together and then they're like, well, this wall has a little bit of space behind it, so we'll pop it there. So they just put this where it fits. So sometimes they just don't have enough space. And that's why our guys are out there every day and they look, they actually measure, they go through and say, you need to cut a vent hole or something. So if there's not enough space, they'll have a pop a vent hole in. So it does get cold air in there. Do we have a list of uh, offenders? Offenders? Yeah, in other words, you know, a coachman or whoever, where they've done it wrong. All of them. Every single one of them. I mean, not habitually, but every plane has their problems, whether it be loose torques, so loose wires, to spacing, because they do model changes twice a year, so they'll, they'll be running a new coach that they're putting this converter in, so it's not the same run of the mill once they worked out all the bugs, it's a new coach, so they're putting in a new space, and then we get there and we're like, we've had one where right below the stove, right next to the converter under the stove is the furnace motor, and the heating duct was actually going across the back side of this right here. So, and you wouldn't believe how hard it is to get them to understand that and actually change it. And I don't know if they've ever actually changed it until they get warranty. So that's the only time they change things is when you have dealers complaining to the OEMs about something failing and then they'll talk to us like, hey, we're getting a lot of these back. And I'm like, well, 
the melting of the plastic shows where your heat run is. <laughs> <laughs> so the dealers are the biggest push to get actual change in the OEM side. So the dealers have a lot. Well, and that's why I asked if there was, so, you know, so we could concentrate on those specific. But it sounds like it's everybody. So it is because we can help get the change because we can get if we can educate the dealer on why they're having a problem and it's because they're putting it here. Some are definitely better than others, but mm, travel trailers are going to be your worst. The items that it, they're pumping out for 25, 30 units a day, I mean, it's not about quality, it's about getting numbers out the door. So when you start getting, I'm not sure what you guys really deal with, but when you get to dealers that mess with like uh, fit wheels or motorized, those are usually a little bit better because they're a lot more money. But when you're in the stick of 10 guys, like the little 20 footers, guys that are pushing those, that's where you're going to see it. most of your problems just because it's a numbers game, not a quality game. Anyone have any questions on the 8900? These only come in two colors black or brown. So you're, you're going to see the same exact thing in either black or brown. Same with the 8700. Are you concerned with the proximity to the battery location with that, like you are an inverter, or does it matter? Closer the better. Yeah. We don't, if we see someone that's running 30 foot to their battery, we're like, it's kind of stupid. One, you're spending a lot of money on wire, and you're going to have voltage drop. Um, so we always try to tell people the closer the better. But again, they don't design where they put the converter, they just put it where they can. So if it's at the back end of the trailer and the battery's at the front, they're making that run. The only way you can get around that is use head gauge yeah. wire. And that's not even going to be a foolproof <coughs> fix either. And that's going to cost you more money. But the inverter is very important. When we get into the inverter, the closer to the battery, the better. But the converter is the same because if the converter is putting out 13.6 volts and you're doing a 30 foot run, you might be getting 13.2 to that battery or maybe even less depending on how much voltage drop and how many connections they have that are bad. Um, there's a lot of factors that come into that one. So guys, that product right there, the 8955 PEC, that's one of our top four selling SKUs in the aftermarket and in the OEM side of the business. It's a good product. It's been around a long time. There's been a lot of upgrades to it. Um, that's what our guys, they're actually testing components on it right now when we were downstairs in the engineering lab. They're working on new capacitors that may help stop some of the warranty with surges, maybe be a little bit more tolerant to bad electricity, <coughs> because that's probably the number one thing that you're gonna see. If a customer replaces our competitors with R8700, is it a same size plug and play fit, or is it a, you have to recut a new hole, or mounting tabs, or brackets, or, um, or is it a universal? We're gonna get into, I don't think we're getting into that today, but when we go over these, I think, actually this, we might be going over this this afternoon after lunch, but in this booklet, if you turn to page 42 and 43, everyone has one. There's a crossover sheet and sizing chart. So this is exactly kind of what you're asking. This has direct replacements. This has the sizing and hole cutouts for all of our products. We don't have the sizes for our competitor products, but we do have a crossover sheet, so on page 42, these are all of our cutout dimensions. This isn't the size of the converter, but this is the size of the hole that our converters go into. So if someone has an old Airstream, like a 1980s Airstream, and they need to cut a new hole, you know exactly what you want to try to get them into. And on the opposite side, these are a list of our competitors. So you have Magnatech, Parallax, Progressive, Iota, Furion, PowerMax, GoPower, Zamtrax, Teletech, Magnum and Precision. This has a replacement for their products with our products. So you got a bunch of comparisons on the sheet that you can use at the dealership. Yeah, in the book, what you have here has our most up-to-date, more modern units. Inside the binder here, there actually is two different sheets in here. One is of an older generation of converters that has the same information. So use both of them. Like I said, this is the newer stuff, and then you've got the other one inside your binder has all the older stuff. You may find some of these older units that have dealers coming with units coming all the time, changing out converters. That would be a direct cross-reference sheet for them. 
whenever we do training, like with dealers and stuff, we do hand these books out so we give these to dealers because this will save a lot of time for them. It will save a lot of headache. If you guys go into dealerships and you want to get them copies of these, all you have to do is send me an email and we'll send out, I'll get Eric to get a bunch of these and we can send them out to anybody. These are not something we hold secret. These go out to anybody and everyone. We're going to be sending out boxes of these catalogs to each one of you, along with cross-reference sheets, the new and old, and laminated forms so that you have them when you're making your dealer calls that you can walk into the dealers with to have the information. Do you have a PDF? We do. Yep. And, yep, we can send you PDF versions of it, everything as well. Except the catalog, I'm not sure if I've got a PDF version of it, but the cross-reference sheet, we have that. Yeah, we do that. Start into that because we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Why don't we take a five minute break real quick? Everybody go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever you want to do, stretch your legs, uh, and then we'll reconvene and start back on that. And that way, okay. before we get going deep into that, there are bathrooms here. And if there's any questions, there are other bathrooms downstairs. Since there's only one really up here. Yeah. <laughs> 
And so we got some, yeah. some, some softer right. chairs back here. You're good. That's right. <laughs> That's right. My heart is in the boat ball. Yeah. Yeah. I sent me an Number one skew. Yeah, it is a 50 MBA. 